Well, thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. That was quite an introduction. Thank you for Chelly. That was very kind of you. I'll pay you that 20 bucks for saying that later. Yeah, thank you. Really awesome. How's everybody doing? All right? So good to see all of you here today. Welcome once again to Community Church. And wow, we're going to have a great time. We're already having a great time. How about that worship this morning? I just got goosebumps, man. Just goosebumps. It was so good. Thank you so much to our our team and our band for leading us in worship. And also, again, just want to welcome all of those on the other side of the camera. Thank you guys for joining us online today. Come on, all those that are here in person, let's let them know how much we love you. And we can't wait to see you. So last weekend, uh, we started a new uh, series, a new collection of talks that we're calling RX, Jesus' Prescription for COVID-19. And we said... Um, When COVID-19 hit back in March, it literally turned all of our lives upside down, didn't it? I mean, it was, it's just been bananas ever since, hasn't it? And um, not only did many of our friends and family members, loved ones, um, maybe get sick and have to recover, and even some unfortunately uh, passed away, it, it fundamentally changed our daily lives. From schools uh, being closed to businesses being shuttered uh, to a literal lockdown and quarantine. And I recall at first, after talking with so many of you and even in my own experience with this quarantine and the lockdown, was that even though it was hard and it was, it was uh, scary and, uh, uh, you know, not going to work or working from home and kids doing school at home and uh, even with just our lives being turned upside down, I felt, and many of you felt, wow, this is, there's a benefit to all of this, that we're getting to spend more time with our family than we've ever spent before. How many remember feeling that way, right? And it was just like amazing having, you know, maybe going from, you know, one family meal a week to like having family dinner every single night because there was nowhere else to go, there was nothing else to do, and uh, literally our lives was just, uh, uh, everything was hit on pause, and we were just at home together. And we just loved that ability to reconnect with our family and those that we live with, our loved ones. But as time has passed, apparently, many of us have now discovered that spending large amounts of time in a small enclosed space even with your family and loved ones, has proven to be much more difficult than we originally uh, expected. Can I get an amen from somebody in the house today? Come on, just amen me right there. Amen me in the chat. Just amen it. Give me something. Give me a little emoji, fire, whatever it is. Um, Because this quarantine has put a major, major, major strain on families and a major strain on relationships Um, enormous amounts of stress out there. Oftentimes, uh, we will take that stress out on those that we love the most, those that we're closest to. Have you ever caught yourself saying something? Like, you would never say this to another human being or a stranger, but you've said it to somebody that you love? Have you ever caught yourself doing One honest person in the crowd, thank you so much. Right? Have you ever, like, I don't know what it is, and it's true of all of us. Things we would never, ever say to another human being that we don't know. We will say some of the most hurtful, unkind things to those that we're closest to and love the most. It's part of our human condition, and that's one of the things that stress and anxiety uh, will do um, to many of us. And... To make matters worse, in addition to COVID-19, our world is still responding to the social injustice and the horrific murder of George Floyd and so many others. It's caused so much anger, so much division, so much unrest in our country from protests that started out peacefully that have turned into now um, angry mobs and riots ruling the streets. We've watched for the past three months Uh, city after city after city in America literally burn. And I believe that we are living right now in the age of rage. It's everywhere. The violence, the vitriol, the hatred, the anger, it rules the day. 
We see it everywhere, on our screens, in the newspaper. It's everywhere. And to top it all off, we're like 40-something days away from a presidential election. That's just like pouring gas on the fire. And it's just everywhere, Republican against Democrat, and blue versus red, black versus white, rich versus poor. So what's the solution? I mean, what would Jesus, the great physician, if he could write a prescription today to bring healing into our land, into your home, into your relationships, into your family, what would Jesus say? You know, one day, uh, this kind of hot shot attorney walks up to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, could you tell me, can you summarize for me, like, what you're all about? Like what you're really, like if you could summarize all of your teaching in one tweet, like if I only had 44 characters to tell the whole world what Jesus is all about, what would it be? And Jesus is like, sure. And in 12 simple words, he gives it to him. Love God with all your heart and love others as yourself. He could have done it in four words. The most important thing in life is to love God, love others. That is the essence of Christianity, to love God and to love others. Love God and love others. It summarizes, Jesus said, all of the Old Testament, all of the law and the prophets, love God and love others. In other words, Jesus is saying the most important thing in life is not things. It's people. It's relationships. Jesus says there's nothing more important in life than relationships. Your relationship with God and your relationship with others. In fact, even Jesus said this to his early followers, his disciples. He said that Here's how an unbelieving, broken, hurting, angry world will know that you're my follower. John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. If you what? If you what? If you love one another. An unbelieving, broken, angry world isn't going to know that you're a follower of Jesus by how many scripture verses you can recite. They're not going to know that you're a follower of Jesus by how much money that you give. They're not going to know that you're a follower of Jesus by how many great prayers that you can pray. He said, an unbelieving, broken, angry world will know that you're my followers by how you love, how you love God and how you love one another. You see, friend, love is the litmus test of a follower of Jesus. It's a litmus test of a true believer, how well you do at loving God and how well you do at loving others. Love is the litmus test. How well are you doing at loving God with all your heart? How well are you doing today at loving others, especially those that are hard to love? Does anybody know anybody that's kind of hard to love? Just by show of hands, raise your hands. Some of you not raising your hands, you're probably sitting next to that person, I understand. (laughs) If you're watching online, um, let's just do this. This will be fun. Um, If you know somebody that's hard to love, just type their name in the chat. Just go ahead. Let's just see what happens. Don't do that. But you know know kind of people, they're like, they're kind of prickly. Anybody know anybody like that? Like trying to love them is like trying to hug a porcupine. It's just, it's really tough and it, it hurts trying to, I call, I refer to these people as EGR people, extra grace required people. Anybody have some EGR people in your life? Like you know who they are, you're, you're, you see their face and you're screen of your mind right now and you're like you know you you walk into a room and you see them and they start walking towards you and you're like oh dear Jesus here comes an EGR 
EGR sighting on my three o'clock, right? You know, we're, we, we all have, you know, people, you know, it's easy to love people that are lovable. It's easy to love people that are kind, but it's really hard to love prickly people, EGR people. But Jesus said, how well do you do at loving others, even those that are hard to love, is a sign to an unbelieving, broken, hurting, angry world that you are one of my followers. You know, there's a, there's a word for love in action. It's a Bible word. It's called kindness. Kindness, you want a good definition of kindness? It's love in action. It's love in motion. In fact, the Bible even says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Would you read it with me? Love is kind. Let's say that again. Love is kind. Kindness is love in action. It's love that's doing something. In fact, the Bible says in Titus 3, 4, it tells us that Jesus is the kindness of God. So if you want to know what love looks like, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love sounds like, listen to Jesus. You know, one day Jesus was trying to help his early followers understand this concept of kindness, which is love in action. And to drive the point home, he bends down and he picks up a bowl full of water and a towel, and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. And he's like, gang, if you want to see what love looks like, watch me. If you want to know what love feels like, watch me. He said in John 13, 15, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And I believe that today, that's one of Jesus' is the great physician, his prescription for COVID-19. That we need to do to others as he's done for us. What this angry, jacked up, hurting, broken world needs now more than ever is kindness. It's kindness. Kindness. Kindness is simply love in motion. It's love in action. And so if Jesus could get out a little prescription pad and write you a little script, I think it'd go something like this. Dad, when it comes to your wife and kids, try a little kindness. Here you go. El Jefe, if you're the boss, if you're the manager, you run a team, you, people report to you, here's, try a little kindness. Mom, we all know moms are perfect, so. Um, <laughs> kids, kids, when it comes to mom and dad, your brother and your sister, try a little kindness. Students, when it comes to your teacher, parents, when it comes to the school board and the administrators, try a little kindness. When it comes to first responders, when it comes to law enforcement officers, try a little kindness. What this world needs now is kindness. What the Poconos needs now is kindness. What the world needs now is kindness. But you might, uh, yeah, go ahead. You want to clap it up? It's not my words. It's Jesus' words. So. And so some of you might be thinking this, though. Well, why should I be kind to others, especially when they're not kind to me? That's a good question. I think it's a question that many of us would ask. So I got two reasons for you today why you should be kind to others. Number one, because God has been kind to you. 
Has God been kind to you? Can I get an amen? amen? Aren't you thankful? Come on, for the kindness of God, which is literally the gift of Jesus. He is the kindness of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, because of God's kindness, because of his what? Because of his kindness, you have been saved through trusting Christ. It's by faith, through grace that we've been saved. It's another way to say that. You see, kindness and grace always go together. It was God's kindness to extend forgiveness and grace to you through Christ. And I'm so thankful for the kindness of God today. I'm so thankful he's been kind to me. I know you're thankful. He's been kind to you too. Here's the second reason I think we need to try a little kindness. Number two, because I want others to be kind to me. I mean, nobody wants other people to be mean to them. We want others to be kind to us. So if you want to be treated right, treat others right. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I mean, Jesus is basically saying, gang, here's a simple rule of thumb to live a good life. Treat other people the way that you would like them to treat you. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Do for others what you would want them to do for you. And so if you're kind to others, others will be kind to you. If you are patient with others, others will be patient with you. But you know, if you're critical of others, others will be critical of you. If you're judgmental, If you're mean or nasty to others, others will be mean and nasty to you. Come on, friends. Who wants to try a little kindness? Come on. Who wants to try a little kindness? You know, the Bible says this in Proverbs 21, 21. Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. See, when you're kind to others, it puts your life in a certain trajectory. It puts your life on a certain path. When you're kind to others, it will put you on a path of righteousness, which is really a right standing with God. When you're kind to others, it'll put your life on a path to more life, not less life. When you're kind to others, it will put your life on a path to honor. So the appropriate response to all the anger And all the negativity, all the rage in our world today is kindness. See, when you're kind, here's what Scripture is really saying. When you're kind, you're, you're only helping yourself. A kind man helps himself, the Bible says. When you're when you are kind, you will find life and honor. So let me give you a few uh, practical two practical ways to practice kindness. I call this the kindness project. Number one, serve others. When you serve others, it's an act of kindness. See what it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Let each of you, not, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What does it say? Let each of you look. Everybody say that word, look. Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. You see, he says look. Kindness, which is love in action, it always starts with how you see things. It it's always begins with your perspective. He says look not only. Don't just see the world and what it could do for you. But look and see what you can do for others. See, how are you looking at things? What is your perspective? And to truly follow Christ means to see the world the way that he sees the world. To truly follow Christ and live a fully surrendered life means to see others the way that Jesus sees others. Jesus himself said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus had the heart 
of a servant. Think about that. I mean, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he emptied himself of all of the glory that was his in heaven. He humbled himself and he came down to earth to show us what God is really like. Jesus himself then says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. He set the example for us to be servant leaders. And he was always sensitive. You just read the Bible. Read the Gospels. And just make a note in the margin. Every time you see Jesus being sensitive to someone else. Someone who is sick. The woman with the issue of blood. The beggar. The blind man. The outcast. The marginalized. The poor. The one who thought he had it all but really had nothing. Jesus was sensitive to the needs of those around him. He shows us what it looks like to be a servant leader. You know, we say around here all the time that servant leadership is our identity. Like serving others, it's not just what we do, it's really who we are. And that's why we say around here that if you're too big to serve, then you're too small to lead. Ooh, that was a good one. Just put that on a coffee cup. We're servant leaders. And here's the deal with servant leaders. They're sensitive to the needs of others around them. They're sensitive to what others need, not just to what they need. So let me ask you, how are you doing when it comes to serving others? Some of you kids in here, dad says take out the trash. You just roll your eyes. When mom says, hey, can you help do the dishes? Do you come up with a million excuses of why you can't and how many videos on YouTube you still have yet to watch? Dad, how you doing? It's serving mom. Serving your kids. Mom, how you doing? It's serving your husband or serving your kids. When you go to work, do you go there with a perspective that, that says, what can I do to serve others that I work with? What can I do to add value to this organization? What can I do to make my work atmosphere and environment a better place? How are you doing at serving others? You know, when it comes to serving others, we need to serve others in our school, in our community, in our homes, in our work. But we also, we also as followers of Jesus, need to serve God through his local church. That's one of the commands of Scripture, that as we serve others through his local church, we're really serving him. And so, one of the reasons for many of you uh, that do not have a pre-existing condition or part of a high-risk demographic for COVID, one of the reasons you need to get back to church is so that you can serve others and by extension, serve God. We need to serve. We need to serve. We need to serve. It's an act of kindness. So if you're still at home and you haven't come back to church, come on back. Get your serve on. We need you. We miss you. And I got some exciting news. How many want some exciting news? We've made a decision this week to relaunch our student ministry, See Youth, here at Community Church. Come on, how about that? We're pumped up about it. We had about... 30 leaders in our home uh, this week. We met with them, uh, Becca and I and our leadership team, and had a wonderful time together and talking, and we've been praying about the future of, of our student ministries, and we've made a decision to, to relaunch uh, our C Youth uh, student ministries. It's going to all happen on Wednesday night, September 30th. It'll be our first in-person regathering of our youth ministry. We will be practicing social distancing, so we're excited about that. 
We're also excited about the fact that as we've been praying, God has answered and we've hired uh, a new youth resident to help lead our uh, youth uh, ministry. He's here today. His name's Ron and uh, Ron Curry. And um, Ron is right out of our church. Uh, he was going to college out in Pittsburgh. He just recently moved back, and we're so excited and, uh, for Ron to be back uh, with us. He's a powerful man of God, loves God, and loves students, and we're excited to see we're gonna, uh, what happens here on, on September 30th. We're going to have a night of worship and a, a, a night of um, prayer together as a student ministry. We'll be doing some fun things as well. And so all your parents out there, maybe uh, uh, you've got some teenagers, some junior or senior high in your home. Make sure you get them back here uh, Wednesday, September 30th. It all happens at 7 o'clock. There'll be a pre-service party, an after-service party. It's going to be a lot of fun. Can we just also, by the way, can we just thank all of our amazing uh, C Youth leadership team that make this ministry happen week in and week out, even through COVID. We love you guys. We're so thankful for you. Your commitment to God, your commitment to students here uh, at Community Church and how you uh, have continued even during this uh, six months of, uh, or seven, eight months of COVID, continue to lead uh, your community groups and we'll be uh, relaunching uh, those community groups as well. And just excited about that. Not only are we relaunching our uh, student ministry, but on October 4th, we are relaunching our kids' ministry right here on Sunday morning at Community Church. Can we get excited about that? So Pastor uh, Deidre, our kids' pastor, uh, is getting her team uh, together on a October 4th, we will relaunch our full-blown kids ministry right here on campus. So make sure that weekend we're kicking off a brand new series. We're calling it Back to Church Sunday. And so you want to come and bring the kids. And we're going to practice again social distancing. But we got to get back to church so that we can serve God by serving teenagers, by serving these young people, so that we can pour the love of God into their life, so that they can grow and thrive And make a decision in these formative years to serve God for the rest of their life. So I want to thank all of our kids ministry uh, team as well. Can we just do that from Pastor Deidre all the way down to uh, that amazing team. Over 250 volunteers on her team. So thank you Deidre and all that you do. And we serve. That's what we do. It's who we are. Servant leadership is our Identity. So let's show a little kindness by serving others. Here's another opportunity that we have coming up this Saturday, talking about serving God and serving others. Uh, we've been planning and uh, praying for months on how we can help feed 500 families this fall, and it's happening this Saturday. So. We've run out of all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bags uh, that you can take to fill up, but, and that's great. Can we just celebrate that? Uh, so even if you don't have one of the food bags that has the list of all the different things that the local food bank has asked us to purchase, and many of those things are actually f- fresh um, vegetables instead of just canned goods or boxed you know, items, um, this is the week to go out and do the shopping. And if you don't have one of the bags, that's okay. You can still participate. Just, you know, just go to the store. We've posted everything on our social media, Facebook and Instagram, um, the list of items that they're requesting us to uh, purchase for these 500 families. How amazing is this going to be to be able to make a huge difference? Come on, for the kingdom of God. And so this week, make sure you go out. Buy those groceries, and we're going to do a, a we're going to do a, a, a drive-through drop-off. So you don't even have to get out of your car if you don't want to. I know some of you still uh, you pre-existing conditions, and you, you're just not ready yet. Uh, and we understand that to come back, but we want you to be able to participate as well. So um, we're all going to be wearing masks. We've got some really cool things planned for that day, and what we're going to do. So let me encourage you, even if you haven't been 
back to church and you didn't get one of these bags, you can still go online, you can still go to the grocery store because you're going there anyway and buy some of these uh, food items and just drop them off at the church and we're gonna bless hundreds and hundreds of families this fall. Isn't that great? So let me just encourage you too. Uh, like we're, my family, we're doing this with our kids and um, we've got our, our, our bag or two at home and we're gonna pray over that bag. We've had it, you know, sitting in our kitchen for the past couple of weeks. And every time we see it, we pray over it. We pray over the family that's gonna receive the food that God would not just feed their, 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 their stomach, but he's gonna feed their soul with this act of kindness. And it might be the very thing that might bring them to church, we don't know. But I just encourage you, pray over that. Make it a little missions trip Maybe get some of your friends, your small group together. Just go with your, your spouse and, and, and go and, and, and make a special trip of it and pray over that. And then when you come and drop it off, we're going to do some special things together. Come on, don't you want to serve others? It's an act of kindness to serve others. And by so doing, we serve God. The Bible says this in Proverbs eleven seventeen: Those who are kind benefit themselves. You see, so many people think that well, if others would just be kind to me, my life would be so much better. It's not true. Your emotional state of well-being depends more on how you treat others than it does on how they treat you. This is science, too, by the way. This is psychological. I mean, the evidence shows this but I don't need to back it up with science. I've got scripture that literally says those who are kind benefit themselves. You want to feel happier? Be kind. I don't care what they did. You be kind. You want to break out of that depression, that discouragement? Be kind. My dad used to say all the time, you ever get discouraged? You ever get depressed? Here's what you need to do. Need to do. Go home. Bake, bake yourself a big batch of chocolate chip cookies. Then wrap them up and go give them to someone else. The person who's kind benefits themselves. Here's the second thing. Not only try a little kindness by serving others, but by speaking life. If we can speak life, it's an act of kindness how you speak is a sign of kindness. Kind people speak life. Kind people speak words of honor. Kind people speak words of encouragement. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 4, kind words bring life, but cruel words crush your spirit. So how, how are you doing with how you talk to other people? How are you doing Come on, let's be kind. Let's speak words of life. Let's speak words of encouragement. Let's be supportive. Let's be positive. Let's be life-giving people. You know, the Bible says the power of life and death is held in the tongue. You can use your words to build others up, or you can use your words to tear others down. So how are you doing when it comes to speaking words of life over others? I came across this little book uh, written by uh, Shanti uh, Feldhan. She worked on Wall Street, was into big data, and incredibly smart, brilliant, uh, gifted uh, woman. And uh, she got saved and wanted to know how could she use her talents to help the church. And so she started doing these massive research, nationwide research um, initiatives, and then she would look at the data, and then she'd write about it. And her most recent work was on kindness, Shanti Feldhen. And uh, I'll post about it this week if you want to read it. It's a great little book. And it's called The Kindness Challenge. The Kindness Challenge. And in this book where she researches kindness, um, she issues this kindness challenge, which I want to issue to you today. For the next 30 days... I want you to pick one person in your life. Just one. Not every, just one. It won't work if you try to do it with more than one. Just one person. 
And for the next 30 days, this could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could be a strained relationship that needs to be, you know, healed, broken, it needs to be healed, or it could be a good relationship that you just want it to be better. Just pick one person in your life, and for the next 30 days, do these three things. Number one, say nothing negative to or about that person for the next 30 days. It's a kindness challenge. Speak no ill will, nothing negative to that person for 30 days. And then don't speak anything negative about them. It's not enough just to not say something directly to them that's negative. Don't pick up the phone and say, you know, you're not going to believe what my husband did. You're not going to believe what my kid did. And you go, you go vent about them to somebody else. No, no, no. For 30 days, do not speak a negative word to or about that person. Here's the second thing. Find uh, something positive to speak into that person's life and about that person every day for the next 30 days. So not only would you say something kind to them, you would then go and tell somebody else how they were kind. You might, you, might, you know, uh, say to your, your wife, oh, you should have seen our son today. He was so kind to his brother. He was really busy, but he stopped what he was doing so he could help his brother. So I would say to the little boy, that was so kind of you to do that. You're amazing. And then I'd tell his mother what a kind boy he had been that day. So for 30 days, say nothing negative. Withhold all negativity to or about that person for 30 days. Find something positive to speak over their life every day for the next 30 days and speak it to somebody else. And here's the third thing. Do something nice. Make it actionable. A small act of kindness or generosity for that person every day for the next 30 days. Just do something nice. It doesn't have to be an act of service. Those are acts of kindness. It could, it could be something where maybe you are busy. Like I know for me, if I'm sitting at home and I work a lot from home now and writing in front of my computer and one of my kids runs up, and, daddy, 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 and they want me to watch some silly video or do something or help them with their homework or something. And, you know, sometimes, typically, uh, you know, I'll be like typing, okay, just in a minute, in a minute, in a minute. An act of kindness could be shut the laptop, turn, give that person your undivided attention, go into their world for the next two minutes. Watch the silly video. Laugh with them. Help them with their homework. It could be something, it doesn't have to be this big, 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 big thing, but make it actionable for the next 30 days. You know what Shanti discovered through her research? That 89% of people, their relationships improved and began to thrive, were healed after 30 days of doing this. So I'm issuing to you today this kindness challenge. Do these things for 30 days and watch what God will do in your own heart and in the relationship with the other person. Listen, friend, kindness has the power to transform people and relationships. Kindness has the power to transform you and to transform the relationships you have with people in your life. So how can you be a kinder person at home, at work, at school, at your church? Serve others. Speak life. That's Jesus' prescription for COVID-19. Try a little kindness. Who's with me? Say amen. Come on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word today. As you have your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you an opportunity right now. If you've never personally experienced the kindness of God through Jesus Christ, I want to give you the opportunity to experience that right now. Jesus is the kindness of God. And he wants to be in relationship with you. He loves you so much he gave his life for you on a cross 2,000 years ago. He laid it down as an act of kindness 
to extend to you grace and forgiveness. He took the penalty. He took the pain. He took the sin and the shame for you. Do you want to know him? Do you want to know his grace today? His forgiveness? You can pray this prayer right now with me in the quietness of your own heart. Heavenly Father, thank you for showing me kindness through your son Jesus. For I'm dying on the cross for my sin, my shame. So I accept your invitation to follow you. I lay it all down. I put my life, I surrender it to you. Forgive me, change me and heal me. And help me to be a kind person. It's in your name I pray. And for everyone else today with your head bowed and your eyes closed, maybe this message really hit home for you today. You love Jesus, I know you do. But it's been stressful. It's been hard at home. It's been hard at work. You said things you wished you hadn't said. Maybe you've damaged some relationships. You're hurting. You've taken it out on the people you love the most. God will forgive you. You know how to pray. But I want to pray this prayer over you today. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you bring healing to hearts and homes. Everyone that's watching this at home today or later back during the week, God, that you would bring healing. You'd restore relationships. And you'd help us all to be a, a little bit kinder. And I just feel, even as I pray, there's some of you that really need to be not kinder to others. You need to be kinder to yourself. You're so stinking hard on yourself. Here's Jesus' prescription to you today. Try a little kindness. Be kinder to yourself than you currently are being. Stop all the negative self-talk. God loves you. He's patient. He's kind. Just be kind to yourself. God, help us. Those that are harder on ourselves. Help us to be kinder to ourselves. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.